Okay, everybody, welcome back from Christmas, and New Year's, and now we got a brand new chapter that we're going to start in the Srimad Bhagavatam second canto, sixth chapter, Purusha Sutta confirmed, or in our case, we're just continuing the discussion between Lord Brahma and his son, Narada Muni, who's also an incarnation of God. And <clears throat> so it's a very interesting um, dialogue because it, it's based on uh, absolute uh, realization of the absolute truth. So it's very, very wonderful. So I'll start with my pranams. Now, Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Shimate Bhaktivedanta, Samaniti Namane, Namaste Saraswati Devam Gauravani Pacharani, Nirvishesha Shinda Vishnachavishtana. As she Krishna Chaitanya Pravanachananda Shivari Vidhashas, the Gauru Bhaktivinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Jai. Hey, there's Rosha. Hey, Rosha. Hope everybody had a really nice uh, holiday break and got some extra rest. And hope everybody is ready for a wonderful year of Krishna Kata, as we plan to do this every Monday night. And we may be doing some other things as well uh, that we are uh, currently have in the works or considering doing. So for those of you who took a nap during the holidays and kind of forgot where we are, <laughs> All right, so uh, we started this process on, on the can uh, second canto with the process of creation. So that was chapter four. And if you remember in that chapter, uh, Maharaj uh, Pariksit uh, had been cursed and that he had given up everything, all attraction for the body, for the wife, for the children, for the palace, for the armies, for the treasuries, and for all of the rest of the things uh, that he had uh, in the material world and given himself up to hearing strictly this conversation of Srimad Bhagavatam recited to him or given to him, uh, you know, just before his imminent death because he was cursed by the Brahma. So it says that he was able to not only give up all attraction for the material world, but in addition... Maharaj Prixit was able to fix his mind uh, fully on Krishna. And he knew of his imminent death. And he started then to ask from the sages there at Naimasharanya, uh, no, excuse me, uh, from Sukadeva Goswami. He had, because I get lost in the context sometimes, he, uh, he had asked all the important questions a man should ask before his death. And so those questions were delineated in that chapter. And uh, that was a wonderful uh, chapter because it was, a, it was a, a way that we can clear up any doubts. Uh, he wanted to know um, uh, how the living entity is or was subjected to falling in a material world and being subjected to the three modes of material nature. So uh, we can all agree, no doubt, that we're subjected by driving forces. We see that we all have a birth chart, for an example. Uh, we have uh, proclivities in this life that we brought from our previous life. Our subtle body uh, brings that with us. And uh, our false ego then conducts activities in the material world, which bind us in one of the three modes of material nature. So he goes through that uh, in that chapter as well. And, uh, describes that, you know, it may be different for everybody, whatever type of influence you may have brought into this life, but you're attracted to senses and sense objects in one of the three modes of material nature. So it's a good opportunity for us to, to study our own lives and see what uh, forces are driving us and how we can then change those with the intelligence to more appropriately meet the desire of the spiritual master and Sri Krishna. So then in chapter five, uh, the, the conversation between Narada and Brahmaji uh, take place. And so 
chapter five, uh, Narda asked, he, he said, please explain the truth to me uh, of the soul and of the super soul and of their relationship. He said, definitively, can you tell me who the controller is? Because he was awestruck with Brahma's power, power to create. So he asked him definitively, please tell me who is the controller? Who is the source of your knowledge? Narda asked him these questions. He asked him, who do you work for? He asked his father, who do you work for? <laughs> I know that was pretty cool. And then Brahma explains to, uh, to Narda that he was inspired to see the prowess of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in that state of awe uh, and veneration, he offered repeated obeisances and wonderful prayers. And you can read all of those in that chapter. So he also said that, uh, he said, those who are bewildered by Maya talk all nonsense in thoughts of I and mine. So that's all nonsense. Anything that we think of in relationship to I and mine, Brahma said was nonsense. So that's an interesting uh, point that he made in that particular chapter, chapter five, I thought a highlight. And then uh, uh, he said that the Vedas actually are meant for understanding the Supreme Lord, mysticism, yoga, austerity, uh, to know the absolute truth, to know the creator, to understand the creation itself. So he goes through that. And therefore, he does explain the creation and the process of creation, specifically in text 24. You might look that one up later and read through that. It's a fantastic uh, uh, synopsis, really, uh, of that. Matter of fact, maybe we can get that for you real quick. Hold on. Let's see if we can pull that up for you real quick. Yeah, here we go. So text 24, he says, the self-centered materialistic ego, thus being transformed into three features, becomes known as the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance in three divisions, namely the powers that evolve matter, knowledge of material creations, and the intelligence that guides such material uh, materialistic activities. Narda, you are quite competent to understand this. So the false ego, the materialistic ego, actually binds us in these three modes of material nature. So we'll go back over that in a little bit. So, um, so they, they continue on. They're discussing the Virata Rupa, actually. This whole conversation is about the Virata Rupa. So in text 40 and 41 in chapter 5, I'm just catching you up. So we're, we're going to start reading this new chapter after this verse. But he says there are seven lower planetary systems out of 14 planetary systems. He discusses what they are, how they interrelate to the body of the Lord. And, uh, you know, in the seventh Batala is on the soles of the feet of the Lord. So he describes all of those uh, features of the Vrat form of the Lord uh, in full and, and the planetary systems that are involved. He also says that others may divide the whole planetary system into three divisions, namely the lower, uh, middle, and upper planetary systems. Sometimes we hear it spoken of in that way, and sometimes we hear of those 14 planetary systems. So now we're on chapter six. I just want to catch you up and give you a little synopsis of what we've been reading uh, in case anybody took a long winter's nap. All right. So now we're on uh, Parisha Sukta confirmed or just a continuation of the conversation. And I'll read a few if you don't mind, and then we'll turn it over to whoever would like. So in text one, Lord Brahma said, the mouth of the Virata Purusa, the universal form of the Lord, is the generating center of the voice, and the controlling deity is fire. His skin and six other layers are the generating centers of the Vedic hymns, and his tongue is the productive center of different foodstuffs and delicacies for offering to the demigods, the forefathers, and the general mass of people. His two nostrils are the generating centers of our breathing and of all other airs. His smelling powers generate the Ashvini Kumara demigods and all kinds of medicinal herbs, and his breathing energies 
produce different kinds of fragrance. His eyes are the generating center of all kinds of forms, and they glitter and illuminate. His eyeballs are like the sun and the heavenly planets. His ears hear from all sides and are receptacles for all the Vedas. And his sense of hearing is the generating, a generating center of the sky and all kinds of sound. His bodily surface is the breeding ground for the active principles of everything and for all kinds of auspicious opportunities. His skin, like the moving air, is the generating center for all kinds of sense of touch and is the place for performing all kinds of sacrifice. The hairs on his body are the cause of all vegetation, particularly of those trees which are required as ingredients for sacrifice. The hairs on his head and face are reservoirs for the clouds, and his nails are the breeding ground of electricity, stones, and iron ore. The Lord's arms are the productive fields for the great demigods and other leaders of the living entities who protect the general mass. Thus, the forward steps of the Lord are the shelter for the upper, lower, and heavenly planets, as well as for all that we need. His lotus feet serve as protection from all kinds of fear. From the Lord's genitals originate water, semen, generatives, rains, and the uh, procreators. His genitals are the cause of a pleasure that counteracts the distress of begetting. O Narda, the evacuating outlet of the universal form of the Lord is the abode of the controlling deity of death, Mitra. And the evacuating hole in the rectum of the Lord is the place of envy, misfortune, death, hell, etc., the back of the Lord is the place for all kinds of frustration and ignorance, as well as for immorality. From his veins flow the great rivers and rivulets, and on his bones are stacked the great mountains. The impersonal feature of the Lord is the abode of great oceans, and his belly is the resting place for the material annihilated living entities. His heart is the abode of the subtle material bodies of living beings. Thus, he is known by the intelligent class of men. So if anybody would like to pick up on text 12. Okay, I'll do. Okay, Roshan. Also, the consciousness of that great personality is the abode of religious principles, mine, yours, and those of the four bachelors, Sanat, Sanat, Sanat Kumar and Sanadana. That consciousness is also the abode of truth and transcendental knowledge. Beginning from me, Brahma, down to you, and Bhav, Shiva, all the great sages who were born before you, the demigods, the demons, the nagas, the human beings, the birds, the beasts, as well as the reptiles, and all phenomenal manifestations of the universes, namely the planets, stars, asteroids, luminaries, lightning, thunder, and the inhabitants of the different planetary systems, namely the Gandharvas, Aspras, Yakshas, Yakshas, Bhutganas, Urugas, Pasus, Pitas, Siddhas, Vidyadharas, and Charanas, and all different varieties of living entities, including the bird, bees, trees, and everything that be, are all covered by the universal form of the Lord at all times, namely past, present, and future. Although he is transcendent to all of them, eternally existing in a form not exceeding nine inches. The sun illuminates both internally and externally by expanding its variation. Similarly, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by expanding his universal form, maintains everything in the creation, both internally and externally. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the controller of immorality and fearness thus and is transcendental to death and to the fruitive activities of the material world. O Nara, O Brahmana, it is therefore difficult to measure the glories of the Supreme Person. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is to be known as the Supreme Reservoir of all material opulences. By the one fourth of his energy, in which all the living entities exist. Deathlessness, fearlessness, and freedom from the anxieties of old age and distress exist in the kingdom of God, 
which is beyond the three higher planetary systems and beyond the material coverings. The spiritual world, which consists of three-fourths of the Lord's energy, is situated beyond this material world and is especially meant for those who will never be reborn, others who are attached to family life and who do not strictly follow celebrity laws must live within the three material worlds. By his energies, the all pervading personality of Godhead is thus comprehensively the master in the activities of controlling and in devotional service. He is the ultimate master of both omniscience and factual knowledge of all situations. From that personality of Godhead, all the universal globes and the universal forms with all material elements, qualities, and senses are generated. Yet he is aloof from such material manifestations, like the sun, which is separate from his rays and heat. Okay. All right. Roshan, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, we got Sue Dave here with us. Is she interested in reading, you think? Can you hear us? I see your phone up, but I don't. I don't know that she's is hearing us. Okay, so if you want to, Rangavati, why don't you read a little bit now? Get the dictation going again. There we go. When I was born from the abdominal lotus flower of the Lord. Mahavishnu, the great person, I had no ingredients for sacrificial performances except the bodily limbs of the great personality of Godhead. For performing sacrificial ceremonies, one requires sacrificial ingredients such as flowers, leaves and straw, along with the sacrificial altar and a suitable time, spring. Other requirements are utensils, grains, clarified butter, honey, gold, earth, water, the Rig Veda, Yeda Veda, and Summer Veda, and four priests to perform the sacrifice. Other necessities include invoking the different names of the demigods by specific hymns and vows of recompense in accordance with the particular scripture for specific purposes and by specific processes. Thus, I had to arrange all these necessary ingredients and paraphernalia of sacrifice from the personal bodily parts of the personality of Godhead. By invocation, by invocation of the demigods' names, the ultimate goal, Vishnu, was gradually attained and thus, compensation and ultimate offering was complete. Thus, I created the ingredients and paraphernalia for offering sacrifices out of the parts of the body of the Supreme Lord, the enjoyer of the sacrifice, and I performed the sacrifice to satisfy the Lord. My dear son, thereafter, your nine brothers who are the masters of living creatures, performed the sacrifice with proper rituals to satisfy both the manifested and non-manifested personalities. Thereafter, the Manus, the fathers of mankind, the great sages, the forefathers, the learned scholars, and the deities and mankind performed sacrifices meant to please the Supreme Lord. All the material manifestations of the universes are therefore situated in his powerful material energies, which he accepted self-sufficiently, although he is eternally without affinity for the material modes. By his will, I create Lord Shiva destroys, and he himself, in his eternal form as the personality of Godhead, maintains everything. He is the powerful controller of these three energies. My dear son, whatever you inquire from me, I have thus explained unto you, 
And you must know for certain that whatever there is, either as cause or as effect, both in the material and spiritual worlds, is dependent on the supreme personality of Godhead. O Narada, because I have caught hold of the lotus feet of the supreme personality of Godhead, Hari, with great zeal, whatever I say has never proved to be false nor is the progress of my mind ever deterred, nor are my senses ever degraded by temporary attachment to matter. Hmm. Although, shall I continue? Or is that good? Well, if anybody else wants to read, I think we only have a few more verses to go. See if somebody else would like to read. If not, then uh, you can continue. No problem. Sue Dave, I saw she was trying to get on, and, and, and but I'm not sure she can do it. What about you? Yes, yes. Oh, there you yes, are. Yes, yes. I can shift back to the bar. Okay. Um, you're hearing me, right? Yes, we are. Would you like to read text from text 35? Yes. yes, I will. Although I am known as the great Brahma, um, Brahma perfect in this in discipline succession of Vedic, of Vedic wisdom, and although I have undergone all austerities and um, an expert in mystic power and self-realization. And although I am recognized su as such by the great forefather of the living entities who offer me respectful obeisances, still I cannot understand him, the Lord, the very source of my board. Therefore, it is best for me to surrender unto his loop, his feet, which alone can deliver one from the misery of repeated birth and death. Such surrender is all auspicious and allow one to perceive all happiness. Even the sky cannot estimate the limit of its own expansion. So what can others do when the Lord himself is unable to estimate his own limit? Since neither Lord Shiva nor you nor I could ascertain uh, the limit of spiritual happiness, how can others demigod know it and because all of us are bewildered by the illusory ex external energy of the supreme lord we can see only this manifested cosmos according to our individual ability let us offer our respectful obeisances unto that supreme personality of godhead whose incarnation and activities are chanted by us for glorification, though he can hardly be fully known as he is. That supreme original personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, expanding his planetary portion as Mahavishnu, the first incarnation creates this manifested cosmos, but he is unborn. The creation, however, takes place in him, and the material substance and manifestation are all himself. He maintained them for some time and observed them in himself again the the personality of godhead is pure being free from all contamination of material tangle tingle he is the absolute truth and embodiment of full and perfect knowledge he is all pervading without beginning or end and without rival o narada O oh, great sage, O oh, great thinker, can know him when 
completely free from all material hankering and when sheltered under undisturbed condition of the senses. Otherwise, by untenable argument, all is distorted and the Lord disappears from our sight. Hare Krishna, somebody can go on. Yep. Okay. Uh, Jai Krishna, or maybe Bhavanand, would you like a little shot at this? <coughs> Prabhu, I'm sorry. I'm just really confused. Okay. Uh, I apologize. That's okay. No problem. How about Bhavanand? Has he got his stuff up? I don't, I don't, I don't see him responding. <laughs> okay, Roshan, you're the man. Text 42. Roshan gets it by default, y'all. <laughs> Go for it. You want to take it 42? You got to unmute. Oh. Okay. There you go. There you go. Karna Nevyasi Vishnu is the first incarnation as a Supreme Lord. He is the master of eternal time, space, cause, and effect mind and the elements and the material ego, the modes of nature, the senses, the universal form of the Lord, Garbo Dakshai Vishnu and the sum total of all living beings, both moving and non-moving. I myself, Brahma, Lord Shiva, Lord Vishnu, great generators of living beings like Daksha and Prajapati, yourself, Narad, and the Komas, heavenly demigods like Indra and Chandra, the leaders of the Burgloka, the leaders of the earthly planets, the leaders of the lower planets, the leaders of the Gandharva planets, the leaders of the Vidyadara planets, the leaders of the Charnaloka planets, Yakshas, Yakshas, Uragas, the great sages, and leaders of the great demons, great atheists, and the great spacemen, as well as the dead bodies, evil spirits, satans, jinn, pusmandas, great aquatics, great beasts, and great beasts, beast. In other words, anything and everything which is exceptionally possessed of power, opulence, mental and perpetual dexterity, strength, forgiveness, beauty, modesty, opulence, and breeding whether in form or formless, may appear to be the specific truth in the form of the Lord, but actually they are not. They are only a fragment of the transcendental potency of the Lord. O Narat, now I shall state one after another the transcendental incarnations of the Lord known as Lila of Pars. Hearing of the activities counteracts all foul matters accumulated in the ear. These pastimes are pleasing to hear and are to be relished. Therefore, they are in my heart. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Lord Brahma, he is saying, he is saying, isn't he? He says that hearing of their activities counteracts all foul matters. Accumulated in the ear. <laughs> Do we have some foul matters accumulated in our ears, ladies and gentlemen? I want to know. <laughs> what do you think, Roshia? Oh, it's perfectly correct because Sukhdev Goswami, he was an impersonalist before, but when he came to learn of the Lord Krishna's uh, Leela, Leelas, his pastimes, he immediately became a personalist. And he took Lord Sri Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's very nice. Very nice point. You know, Sankaracharya said that on his very last words. He mm -hmm. said that, uh, what is it, Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. Did he say that? I yes, 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 yes. So he said that, you know, even though he had been preaching in personalism his whole yeah. life and confounding people with impersonalism, uh, and personalism can never satisfy it, number one, because mm -hmm. to try to, we, we already read this in a different chapter where it says to try to meditate on the, uh, on the formless mm -hmm. is very difficult because everything in our vision is form, you know, and we're used to relegating form and seeing form and identifying with form. 
even the deity, you know, in, on the altar, you know, where we need that form so that we can love a personal God, not just some bright light in the sky. There's no actual joy in that. So these foul matters that have filled our ears and these false philosophies or partial philosophies or just confounding um, um, hypotheses that we hear just concocted in the minds of scientists or teachers or educators or so-called philosophers like Darwin or whatever. Um, this is all nonsense. It's all nonsense. And those topics are meant for people who are destined for repeated birth and death. Yeah. Unfortunate. So we have to change our desire. We have to just dovetail the desires. You're not going to give up desires. You got the same. You're going to have desires unlimited. When you get back to the spiritual world, you have unlimited desires. And all of these mystic siddhas allow you to, to perform uh, these unlimited services to the Lord in different bodies at different times and different situations. There's no restriction like there is here. Here, we're very restricted. Our soul is encased in this machine made of material energy, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, false ego, right? And above that sets the soul, according to the Bhagavad Gita. So in this predicament, we are looking through our senses and we are believing that this is the truth that we're seeing in front of us. But we know that it's been described previously in other chapters that even the Varata Rupa is is not is not real yeah. it's a way of meditating on the lord no question that we can meditate on the lord from the feet all the way to the head and we can understand what all these uh different parts of the lord's body uh uh, uh are for and and what they're meant for and how they affect us and how things have been created from that but this is all a dream this is all a dream and the issue is that as long as we want something in the material world, you're going to come back and get it. You're going to experience birth in a material body. And you're going to be affected by the three modes of material nature. Right? And those three modes of material nature are going to taint or tinge, as Sudev was reading, tinges, it tinges our consciousness. It's like looking at the world through colored glasses. If you go down the street and you ask a hundred people or even a thousand people or a million people straight in a row, they all have mentally concocted desires and they believe that that thing that they're after, so desperately after, they think that that will satisfy them. And do we see them being satisfied? No. As a matter of fact, what happens is, is because they are not satisfied, they become frustrated. And once they're frustrated, they, be, they can become uh, angry. And we know that wrath uh, can, can take place. It's like an insanity. We're seeing it every day. Now they're posting these things online every day where somebody is completely spun out of control in anger. And wrath now has taken over and they've acted in such a way that they've not only jeopardized their own lives, but the lives of others for what? For a temporary satisfaction of one of the material senses of the body. That's what they've done that for. They're willing to rob you to satisfy one of the senses of the material body. It may not even be satisfactory for a few hours. And then they got to go do it again. We're all like drug addicted uh, people. We, we, we need to get into the hospital. I call it the Bhaktivedanta hospital. <laughs> we need to check in <laughs> because when we do check in, we're going to hear the absolute truth. We're going to take the medicine that will cure these ahankaras, these things that are obstacles on the path back home, back to Godhead. All of these issues that you're having individually, I'm having individually, every one of us is having individually, is coming from mental concoction in, in a state of illusion, thinking that, man, I can be God. 
I can actually enjoy it. This is mine, right? It's all about me. <laughs> this is what we heard Brahma just say a minute ago, that these people are talking all nonsense. These people are scheduled for death. The people who think I and mine are in the greatest illusion. And therefore they're manufacturing new ideas every day thinking that, oh, if I just do it this way, then it'll be satisfactory. Or if I just had that, then finally my life would be complete. If I had the most beautiful wife, if I had the biggest bank account, if I had the, you know, the, the, the biggest house, the biggest mansion, if everyone worshipped me, if everyone were, you know, uh, my fan or this or that or some nonsense like this, they think they would be happy. But all they're doing is creating one anxiety on top of the next, stacking anxieties. And it's all a house of cards. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, those that house of cards will topple. And that generally happens when we call somebody uh, flipped out, you know, <laughs> or some, somebody had a breakdown or somebody burned completely out or somebody, you know, went postal. Right. I mean, there's all <laughs> kind of... <laughs> There are all kind of these little colloquialisms for people who flipped out. Yeah. One time, uh, Ridananda Maharaj said way back in the 70s, it was a funny lecture I remember listening. He said, so the material world is like a flip-flop. Hmm. We, like, we don't understand, Maharaj. He said, yes, you, you flop in and then you flip out. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's like a flip-flop. Yeah. So, and everybody here is blowing out their flip-flop on a pop top, right? We've heard that in the song. And so when that flip-flop blows out, they stumble and they fall and they trip and their life becomes destroyed. They lose their family. They lose their wealth. They lose their money. We see that divorce rates now are, are like 84% or so. I, I can't even keep up with it. People won't stay together because the moment that you displease my sense organ, and then you have to go. Hmm. Prabhupada said in his day, there was no such thing as divorce. There was no divorce. People didn't divorce. They stayed together. They understand it's a hard struggle for existence. They understand there's going to be a lot of work here to maintain body and soul together. They know that. And they need to band together. Right? But now we've become so vain that uh you know we it's almost like a designer marriage you know you, you go out shopping for somebody they have all these sites now where you can put in what you want and then so-called perfect girl or or man shows up for you and you can see how that works out divorce rates are still very high the reason the divorce rates are high is because no one is actually committed no one is actually making a vow the whole thing that we just read is all about making vows and living up to those vows and performing sacrifice. Why? Because we've left the Lord. We betrayed God. We were living, enjoying with God. But if you think, oh, well, I could enjoy like Krishna is. then Krishna says, of course, I love you that much. Here's a nice place, material world. You can give it a shot. How's that going? Old age. We don't want it. Look in the mirror. There it is. <laughs> Every day a new lie. <laughs> right? So we don't want it. We don't want this. It's abhorrent to us. We're, we're not morbid. We're, we're transcendental to this stuff. I mean, just look at the world. Bhaktivinoda Bhakti Bhakti calls... The forms in the material world that we're attracted to, the bodies of others and things that attract us, he calls them dazzling, deadly, liquid forms. Dazzling, deadly, liquid forms. You know, we were taught in school that our bodies are water bodies, right? So we know that we have a water body, right? So uh, 
you know, but on different planets and different places, they may have a fire body. They may have a different type of body. We don't understand that because our senses are limited. We can know these things from Shastra. We cannot know them from our scientific uh, understanding. You know, I was uh, looking at this today. And did you know that one light year, one light year, <clears throat> right? Or, or, yeah, you may know more about this than I do, Roshan, but... The, the thing was that light travels at 186,000 some change miles per second. So take 186,000 miles per second and accumulate that into a full 360 days of seconds. So in one light year, we haven't even tra traveled literally out of our little solar system here. Mm -hmm. So it, you can travel there literally to cross just this galaxy takes trillions of light years, according to the scientists. Yeah. So how are we really, honestly, people, how are we to know these things with imperfect senses, extension of perfect senses called a microscope or a telescope? It's an extension of a perfect, imperfect sense. Okay. And therefore we become um, prone to cheating and taking shortcuts because our senses are imperfect. We can't not relegate. We can't even put time together. We don't understand that these civilizations that have been rising and falling like bubbles on the sea of time date back uh, eternally. Time is eternal. Time, the material world is manifest for a while. And it's unmanifest at the end of Brahma's day. It's unmanifest. And then we know that at the end of Brahma's life, there's, a, there's an unmanifest period there as well. So we go into a state of sleep, deep sleep. We don't know what's going on. And then we appear again. You know, I bet everybody who's ever really been a thoughtful person has at some point in their life woke up and went, what is going, what is this place? How did I get to this place? What am I doing in this place? I'm looking out at a universe. There's trillions of stars. They have one picture that was made by the new telescope, right? I've forgotten the name of it. Oh, the Webb telescope. And it's, it's a picture just of one little centimeter of the sky at night. But because it's such a distant view of the universe, it says that each one of those lit up dots is a galaxy. So there's like unlimited galaxies in one little centimeter of the universe. Krishna cannot even understand his own potencies. According to this chapter we just read, just like we can't un un understand the expanse of the sky. We don't know the bounds of that. We can't understand the bounds of that. If you could climb in your little rocket ship and blow yourself through the sky, which just sounds ridiculous anyway, if you think about it, climbing into a, a machine filled up with rocket fuel, it's like a big bomb. And sometimes it turns into a bomb. But we would rather go externally to find the answers than to go inside or to hear from the prom pra or the spiritual master or to hear from the authorized scripture. We would rather try to go out and find it out ourselves. What happened to Brahma when he did that? He looked all around the lotus flower. You remember? <laughs> he couldn't figure out where it was coming from. He couldn't figure out where this big water ocean was. He couldn't. And the water in the navel of Mahavishnu and the lotus flower, the umbilical cord of God. And he's on it and he's, he's looking around. He can't figure it out. Finally, he hears ta pa sha what does that mean, Roshan? Tapasya. I think um, tapasya. tapasya. Means, uh, I think he was told to uh, to worship, to meditate there on the go. word Om. I think <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> correct. So he did that, and when he sat down in a deep meditation, everything was revealed from within, not from without. Right. So the, the journey is within. It, you can't even go to the coverings of this one little solar system. You don't even know what's going on out here. 
If you want to know transcendental knowledge or absolute knowledge, you want to know what the 14 planetary systems are, where are you going to get that at? Your local scientist? He has no clue. My roommate, when I was in Atlanta, was Richard L. Thompson. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him, Sataputta Das. He was a, a, a PhD a scientist, a, a mathematician. And he had been in the process of, of uh, helping Srila Prabhupada prove the existence of God through mathematics. And I was his roommate watching him do this. And uh, Swarov Damodar, another scientist, you might remember him, Swarov Damodar, uh, he would come to the room there and I would just sit in the corner and listen, you know, and just try to serve these great devotees uh, who were trying on behalf of the spiritual master to relegate this understanding and bring it into a spiritual uh, vision, bring it all into the appropriate spiritual vision instead of it being discombobulated. You know, like we know this one little piece of information here. We know that one little piece of information there. We found out little things. It would be looking like uh, looking at a puzzle and finding like the puzzle contains 10,000 pieces. You've got seven of them. You think you're going to recreate that picture with seven pieces of the puzzle? Probably not. So they're guessing. They're guessing at it. They're hypothesizing. They're postulating theorem. And it gives them a big name. And they get it attached to their prestige, uh, their, to their academia and their prestige. And they glorify one another in that body or in that assembly of scientists. But over a period of time, almost all of it has been proven wrong over and over and over again. So how would you like to spend your entire life working on something and you postulate a theory, you become famous for it, you die, and then you're discredited? Right? <laughs> Prabhupada said, yes, they may put statue in the court square, but then the pigeons come and they pass the stool on the head of these great personalities in the material world. There are no great personalities in the material world. I mean, the ones that are there are the ones we find in these great Shastric accounts like Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay. But the rest of these persons, well, they'll be buried soon. Maybe someone will come. For one generation. But then the next generation, it's all forgotten. Everything is forgotten. So therefore, Krishna comes again and again and again, right? We find that. Yada, yada, hidharma shai. comes again and again and again to reestablish truth because we get off the track. We get off the track with our false ego. We get off the track nice. with these. Yeah. Hey, Krishna. Is that uh, Rakesh? Hi, right, Krishna. Hey, Rakesh. Yes. Good to see you. Uh, good, I'm glad you're here. Do you have any question? Well, why don't you, if you want to, Rakesh, go ahead and mute, and then you can join the conversation. Okay? Appreciate you being here. So what we're going to do, if you don't mind, guys, is we're going to go back over a few of the verses in this chapter that I think stand out and need to be a little bit further analyzed, if that's okay with you. So the first verse that stuck stuck out in my mind in this particular chapter was verse 19. So uh, 19 and 20. So you can follow with me on this one. It says, the Supreme Personality of God, it is to be known as the supreme reservoir of all material opulences, by the one-fourth of his energy in which all the living entities exist. Deathlessness, fearlessness, and freedom from the anxieties of old age and disease exist in the kingdom of God, which is beyond the three higher planetary systems and beyond the material coverings. So there's one really uh, nice picture on the first canto, and it shows <clears throat> a little cloud in the spiritual sky, about one quarter of the spiritual sky little cloud that's where we are that's where we are that's where all the material universes exist all the living entities exist all the material energy exists 
The material opulences are all here, right? But it's a place of death, right? So deathlessness and fearlessness and freedom from anxieties of old age and disease and all of these other things, they don't exist here. They exist in the kingdom of God. They exist in via kunta or the spiritual world. We're in kunta. Kunta means a place of anxiety. <clears throat> Everyone is in constant anxiety. So to get ourselves free of that anxiety, we have to become transcendentalist. Transcendentalist can be fearless even in this body, in this life, in this world. So they asked Prabhupada one time, they said, Srila Prabhupada, what's it like to be a pure devotee? Has anybody ever heard this before? They asked him, he said, what's it like to be a pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada? He thought for a moment, he said, mm, fearless. <laughs> fearless. <laughs> so to be fearless in the material world is really an oxymoron for people who are attached to family, home, wealth, power, privilege, and any of the other items that we are uh, you know, addicted to in the material world, which happened to be our form of addiction, right? So we have to research our mind and we have to say, if I want to be a resident of the spiritual sky, which is a place of fearlessness, uh, uh, deathlessness, complete freedom of movement and travel and of desire, please the Lord, how do we get there? The spiritual world in text 20, it says, consists of three-fourths of the Lord's energy. And it's situated beyond this material world. It's especially meant for those who will never be reborn. What did, what did we say earlier? Brahma said that this place talking all nonsense in terms of thoughts of I and mind, this, this is meant for people who are marked for death, for repeated death. So here it says that no, that in the spiritual world, it, it is meant for people who are especially meant for those who will never be reborn. And others who are attracted to family life who do not strictly follow celibacy vows must live within the three material worlds. So, okay, false ego... False ego is a problem because false ego <clears throat> is a lie. False ego is telling you that you're God, <clears throat> that you can build a home in this world. <clears throat> Recently, we published a song. Uh, Rangavati put it on this site for me. And it's a song, <clears throat> and the words are, we live in a house burning down. The fire and the flame, it's all around. Still, we try to set up permanent residency in this place. <clears throat> we try to set up permanent residence and we start hanging pictures on the wall, right? We start moving in, but we find that we can't stay. No matter if we want to stay, we're all gonna be evicted at the time of death. So the devotee prepares their life, their whole life to be prepared to transfer the soul back to the spiritual sky and never be reborn in this miserable condition. Abrahma bhuvana loka, loko yam karma bandana. You want to be bound in karma, doesn't matter if you go to Brahma loka or wherever you go, you're going to suffer. So, what's the answer? Yajartat karma non yacha loko yam karma bandana, tadartam karma kontaya mukta sangha samachara. We have to work for Krishna. We have to add Krishna to everything we're doing right now, to everything you're going to do later, to everything you're going to do tomorrow, to the dreams that you're going to have tonight. <laughs> you add Krishna to all of that. Hare Krishna, Rakesh. You're looking good, buddy. <laughs> so you add Krishna to all of that, and then your life is perfected. Then you become deathless, right? You don't get enamored with temporary pleasures. In the material world, matra sparsas to kontaya, satosna sugita. Don't get enamored. Don't do it. Right? Because then you become a bewildered spiritual soul. You become a soul under the influence of the three modes of material nature. Prakriti kriyamanani. 
Gunai Karmani Sarvashaha, right? So they think themselves the doer of activities which are actually carried out by nature. So man proposes, God disposes, right? Whatever you want, God will give you. You may, you may, God may say in all the Shastras, through all the spiritual masters, no, don't, don't desire these things. Don't do these things. But you say, no, Lord, I'm going to do them anyway. Then the Lord fulfills. Even if you want to become an atheist, he'll help you forget him. He says that. If you want to worship a demigod or some temporary material benefit, he'll make your faith in the demigod very strong so that you can worship the demigod nicely, right? Whatever your destination, whatever your desire is, you can have. There's all types of these some scars and so forth in India that you can go through to try to give yourself some sense gratification. Unfortunately, the wise person, he says, does not take place in the sources of misery, which are caused by the connection of the senses with their sense objects in the material world when it's deviated from the will of Krishna. So in these two, two verses in 19 and 20, we see that there are two different places. One is a little cloud in the actual existence of the spiritual world, eternal existence, and that's us. Constantly mutable, endlessly mutable, changing at every moment, right? Right, the weather, the seasons change, the birth, the death, everything is going on, danger at every step. <clears throat> and then there's three quarters of the universe, <clears throat> which are the spiritual sky, the Vaikuntha planets and Goloka Vrindavan, which we can enter when we become firmly fixed as Yudhisthira was fixed. We heard about that. He was able to give up everything for the sake of Krishna. So when we see things in, in their true context, it's easy to give them up. If I were standing here with $10 billion here and $1 here, and I said, here's your choice. Take the 10 billion or the $1. I mean, any intelligent person is going to take the 10 billion. But if they don't know it exists, well, they'll just take anything as reality. Right? So if they don't know it exists. So well, Krishna comes to reestablish the principles of Dharma so that you know it exists. He comes to show his prowess in battle, and he shows his prowess in the material world in every shape, form, and fashion by killing demons from his earliest childhood throughout his whole life. He kills armies. He killed 21 armies when he went to Dwarka. Come on. Krishna is, there's no one that could be equal to nor greater than Krishna. Brahma, who's speaking here, he says, Ishvara Parama Krishna Satchitananda Vigraha. An adir, adir govinda, sarvakarana, kanana. So his body is made out of eternality, knowledge, bliss with form. And he's the one without a second. And he goes on, he says, Venum kwanantam aravinda uh, vilayataksha bar havatam samasitam buddha sundarangam kandarpa koti kamaniya vishesha shobam govinda mari purushan tamaham jambi. So he says, that he describes who God is, what he looks like, how he's beautiful, he's charming millions of cupids, the peacock feather, the bluish, everything is there, right? And he goes on to say, he goes on, he says that all of his senses, all of his bodily features are inter interchangeable. He can create, impregnate with his glance. He can do anything. So if you want to know who God is, you need to go to the first created being who's Lord Brahma. And I just told you what he had to say. And there's 50 more verses if that didn't convince you. Okay. So if you want to know who your father is, you go to your mom. She knows. <laughs> you could ask every man on planet Earth, are you my daddy, sir? Excuse me, are you my father? It's not going to work out for you. But if you go to your mom, she'll, she'll tell you exactly who your father is. So if you go to Brahma, he will explain who the Supreme Lord is. Who does he say? Govindam Adipurusham. 
Govindam is the supreme first God, which no one can be equal to nor greater than. So that's some sweet stuff right there. Now, if we go on up to text 34, man, we're drinking nectar. I mean, this stuff is nothing but nectar. I mean, you could just drink this eternally, and that's what you're going to do. You're going to change your desires from some nonsense uh, person in the material world who couldn't save themselves. And you're going to change that to the Supreme Lord. And that's going to be your idol. God will be your idol. Okay. So he says, <clears throat> he tells Narada, Brahma tells Narada, his son, Oh, Narada, because I've caught hold of the lotus feet of the Supreme Person out of Godhead, Hari, with great zeal. I might add, whatever I say has never proved to be false, nor is the progress of my mind ever deterred, nor are my senses ever degraded by temporary attachment to matter. This should be our prayer. How we can catch hold of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead with great enthusiasm, with all of the humility we can muster, right, at our command. Grab the Lord's lotus feet. And then when you speak, if you're living according to these principles, your words are true and they will affect the hearts of people because Krishna then <clears throat> speaks through you. They asked Prabhupada, they said, you've written all these books? He said, Krishna wrote these books. Krishna wrote these books. Spiritual master surrendered <clears throat> to Krishna so the Lord's speaking through the spiritual master, the pure devotee. So he goes on to say, <clears throat> although I am known as the great Brahma, perfect in disciplic succession <laughs> of Vedic wisdom, and although I have undergone all austerities and expert in mystic powers, and although I'm recognized as such by the great forefathers living entities, still I cannot understand him, the Lord the very source of my birth. Excuse me. If somebody would like to make a comment. <clears throat> Anybody have a comment, question? I've been having this <clears throat> little drainage here. I apologize for that. <clears throat> so he cannot understand the Lord, the source of his birth. Therefore, it is best for me, he says, to surrender unto his feet, <clears throat> which alone can deliver one from the miseries of repeated birth and death. Such surrender is all auspicious and allows one to perceive all happiness. Even the sky cannot estimate the limit of its, of its own expansion. So what can others do when the Lord himself is unable to estimate his own limits? So... <clears throat> Brahma says, therefore, it is best for me. I don't understand. I don't understand. So it's best for me just to surrender. So do you think we're going to one-up Brahma here and we're going to understand we're going to be great Gyanis or something? Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> we're going to know more than Brahma? We're going to understand more than the Vedic literature? No. So our goal then would be to follow in the footsteps of the Brahma Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya right, which is our Sampradaya, which recommends here by Brahma's own mouth, or his own words. Therefore, it is best for me. I can't, under, I can't understand him. I can't figure him out. He, can, he doesn't even know himself. He's that great. Certainly not. I didn't do it. Krishna did it through me. He was inspired, and Krishna uh, did all these things through Brahma. And so he says, therefore, it's just best for me to surrender. <laughs> so that's the instruction that Krishna gives uh, in the Bhagavad Gita. Just surrender to me. Do not fear. I will protect you. So if Brahma thinks that Krishna, that he can surrender to Krishna, he feels protection from Krishna and empowered by Krishna. Is there any greater conclusion we should come to? Has anybody got a better theory? You got a better hypothesis than Brahma? 
Would you rather listen to the scientist? Now, who are you going to listen to? <clears throat> no one knows this information. It's been preserved in this codex called Sanskrit language, and it's being passed down by thoroughly honest spiritual masters. Where are you going to get that? You're not going to get it. No, it's not available. It's available here. We need to avail ourselves of this constant hearing and chanting. Just like Arjuna said, when Arjuna came back, he'd been sent by Yudhisthira to Dwarka, and he saw that the, the whole dynasty, the Yadda dynasty, had been uh, destroyed. Krishna had left. He was dejected. He came back. <clears throat> Even peasants were able to defeat him even though he was the same Arjuna with the same chariot, the same battle, the same armaments, the same weapons, everything. But he had no Krishna in that example. Of course, he had Krishna. But you understand that because Krishna had left, all those powers had also left with Krishna. And Kali or had, had come into the world to destroy the population and degrade the population, which he's done a pretty good job here in Kali Yuga, I must admit. So uh, so he goes on, he says, since neither Lord Shiva nor you nor I could ascertain the limits of spiritual happiness, how can the other demigods know it? And because all of us are bewildered by the illusory external energy of the Supreme Lord, we can only see the manifested cosmos according to our individual ability. So <clears throat> that's the problem. That's why we surrender to the Lord. Because we'll never be able to know more than Brahma or Shiva or Narda. And their option was to completely surrender to the Lord. The Lord himself is said to do it in Bhagavad Gita. All of his great servants in the Srimad Bhagavatam all did it. And their examples are proven and how they were transferred back to the spiritual sky. Right. So, so that's our purpose here. And, uh, Krishna says, Janma karma chame divyam evam yo veti tapataha chakta deham panar janma naitima miti sorjana. So, one who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the material body, take his birth again in the material world, but attains to my eternal bodo, Arjuna. <clears throat> and this is what Brahma was just talking about. This is exactly what Brahma just said, that three quarters of the, of the, of the sky of the existence is meant for those eternally nitya siddhas. We're nitya badha. We're bound in the material world. So nitya siddha eternally perfected. When we go back, we don't come back again. And Krishna says that, that every, after, after having come to the spiritual world, they never take birth in the material world again. So um, the personality of Godhead is pure, being free from all contaminations of material tinges. He's the absolute and embodiment of full perfect knowledge, all pervading, without beginning, without end, and without rival. So where else did you want to go with this? Is there something else somewhere that's higher, that's better? Uh, please bring it. Let's take a look. I spent my last 70 years trying to find what might be better. My option is to surrender to the Lord because there is no greater destination. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, the, uh, he goes on then at the end of this, he, he starts telling uh, about all the incarnations of the Lord, which are pleasing to hear and counteracts all foul matters accumulated in the year. <laughs> I don't know that it could be said better than that. I'll, I'll be honest with you. So thank you guys for coming. Is there any questions or comments? Uh, we're at 8.09 and I, I told Rangavati I was going to try to Finish the class uh, within an hour. I didn't know if that would be possible or not, but uh, I'm trying. So, are there any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, I'm going to end it. I'm going to end it with this verse for you. This is from Bhagavad Gita 435, and so it says in this verse. 
that when you have learned the truth, right? When you have learned the truth, you will know that all living beings are but a part of me and that they are in me and they are mine. <laughs> so we've heard from Brahma today, speaking to Narda, and then he'll continue in the next installment next week and uh, with a most relishable topic, which is the incarnations of the Godhead. And these are called Leela avatars, by the way, in the description in the next chapter. So these are activities of the pastimes of the personality of Godhead. So we can know God. We can know God perfectly well. We can become God realized if we study the Srimad Bhagavatam and we follow the regular the principles of freedom as they are described by Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. The whole goal is to quiet the senses in the material world and let that stillness, let God speak to you in that stillness. <clears throat> so if you can quiet yourself down, which is the point of yoga, still the mind, let the pond become completely still. You can see a, a good reflection in a still pond. But if you throw one thing in it, then everything is distorted. You throw one, one rock. Now everything is distorted. The face is doing this. Looks like you're in the circus or something. <laughs> right? So we have to steal the mind. Stita dira. You know what that means? That means to be quiet. To be still in the mind. To know God. To understand God. So take your mind off all this material contamination, all this material concoction of eat here, smoke that, drink this, buy that, you'll be happy. No. Take your mind away from that nonsense. <clears throat> You're marked for death if you think like that. If you want to be marked for the spiritual sky, you have to uh, fill your mind, your cup, till it runs over with these transcendental information, instructions, and stories and Leela of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his great stalwart devotees. Art Christian. <laughs> so is there anything else? Anybody got anything else? Because if you don't, I'm getting ready to end the recording. You guys want me to end the recording. I can see you're still a little sleepy from the holidays. Don't worry. We're going to go an hour and a half next time. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I don't know. We'll, we'll do it the best we can. But thank you so much for being here. We got a good crew here with us tonight. We hope that uh, Jai Krishna gets to feeling better. So nice to see Rakesh here with us. Roshan, you're uh, amazing. We love you dearly. Sue Devi, uh, Rangavati, Bhavananda, and anybody else who happens to be listening or will listen in the future. We love you, and we want only the best for you. If you look at the way Prabhupada always signed his letters at the at the bottom. What did it say? Your ever well wisher. Your ever well wisher. So, and what did uh, who who said that? Maharaj Brixit said it. He said, "I just want to be a kind friend to all living beings, and I never want to forget Krishna if I have to come back." So let's learn to do that. Thank you for the good association you've given me tonight, and thank you for your wonderful reading. And we'll pick it up from here next week. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Haribo. Hare Haribo. Hare Haribo.